Hello, friends. Welcome back to our next installment of Gramophone Live. Tonight, we're going to be joined by our friends from Bowers and Wilkins in Morantz. And I got to say, Morantz especially has got some really cool stuff coming out for us. Joining me tonight is my buddy Pete. He is the brand activator. And we're also going to be joined by Gary, who is the senior product marketing manager for both Morantz and Class A. Basically, it's Gary's job to know everything about these products. So he's here to help us understand them. And everything they're going to be talking about tonight is some stuff I've been really excited about, particularly what you see in front of you right now. This is a Morantz AV10. This thing is crazy. And I am really, really excited to get into it. But guys, before we get into the whole grind of talking about the products, let's talk about us a little bit. Pete, can you tell me a little bit more about you, your experience with audio, both as an enthusiast and in your your time in the industry? Yeah. So, you know, I've been in the industry for, you know, over 15 years now, just in different jobs from sales to being on the vendor side. And part of my job now is to, you know, educate a lot of a lot of salesmen, a lot of the staff on products that we're coming out with new stuff, old stuff, you know, what makes us different. And uh, much like you, I'm very, very excited about the, the new AV10, Am10. I am a particularly precious to home theater, and I'm really excited about launching these products and what they're going to be able to do and what some of the technologies that we've implemented into all the Morantz line that's going to really be, you know, th that the word, the term game changer is thrown around a lot. Yeah. But, and I don't want to necessarily throw that around, but, you know, from directional base to just what is able to be built inside this, I'm sure Gary's going to go a lot more in detail into it. I am super excited and, you know, and pairing that with something like a Bowers and Wilkins speaker, it's going to be, you know, the perfect pairing. Oh, absolutely. And with this AV10, from what we've already seen, like Morantz is going in a direction they haven't really gone before, like moving up to another tier. We hope so. We sure hope so. Gary, how about you, man? Tell me a little bit about you, your experience as an enthusiast, and then, of course, just being in the industry. Yeah, Luke. So I've been uh, I've been into music and, and audio, you know, ever since my early teens, you know, making mixtapes for girlfriends. You know, that kind of you know got me kicked off. And, you know, I, I studied uh, broadcasting and, and record production and engineering when I was in university and then started my uh, my audiophile career uh, back in 2005 with another high end loudspeaker company and and then moved over to a, another amplifier company. And then I've been with Massimo Consumer now for about two years working with Marantz and Class A. So I've always kind of straddled the line between uh, engineering and and uh, and marketing and, and sales. So I'm I'm usually the guy that people turn to at the company when they need an easy to understand explanation for something highly technical. So I'm I'm going to try and fill that role for you guys tonight and share some of my enthusiasm and information about AV10 and Am10 with you. But I think we're going to get everything started by talking about Marantz tonight. Marantz has a whole new line of receivers that's coming or has come rather. And now the AV10 has finally landed, and this sits at the top of the entire stack. Am I correct? I believe so. Yes, that is that is correct. So, guys, the AV10, the new cinema series, I guess we'll start, start with the AV10 because we literally got it on the table here. What exactly is going on with this product? I, I know a few things, but Gary, I want to ask you, what is Marantz's goal with the AV10? Because it is clearly something a little bit different than what we've seen in the past. Yeah, it's a great question. So I think those people who have followed Marantz over the past few years have seen us steadily tick up market and get more ambitious with our designs and our audio quality. Uh, we saw that with our Model 30 and SACD 30N Hi-Fi components that were released back in 2020. Uh, Model oh, yeah. 40N changed the game last year for streaming integrated amplifiers. So late last year and early this year, it was our turn to bring these innovations to the home theater theater space. So as you said, we completely refreshed our home theater AVR lineup and we designed an entirely new processor and amplifier combination designed not to replace existing models, but to sit at the very top of the heap. Uh, we wanted to really let our engineers spread their wings and develop products that they thought were as good as they could possibly get in terms of sound quality, reliability, design, channel count, features, uh, intuitiveness, ease of use, and just you know, pleasure of, of ownership. So uh, among those, those flagship products, the AV10 is the preamp processor, and the AMP10 is the partnering amplifier. So if you combine the two, you can be assured that you'll have a reference level home theater. That sounds awesome. So with the AV10, what is 
what are some specific things to call out about what's under the hood of this guy that's set, setting it apart from what we would generally expect from Morant's? What is uh, what would you say are some of your favorite innovations with it? Well, let's take a look first at some of the features that, that we've added to, to AV10. Um, so with last year's or well, two years prior, the, the SR series, uh, we were among the first companies to release support for 8K HDMI, so 8K60. Thank you for that, by the way. Yeah, so those uh, those SR series uh, receivers and uh, and then the AV seventy seven hundred six processor and eventually the AV eighty eight hundred five A processor could support eight K on a single input, and this was sufficient if you had one game system, you know, that that could really maximize that. But we've seen customers get more interested in having multiple game systems. They want to future proof and get ready for for more eight K content coming down the line. So with AV ten, we wanted to make sure that anybody who bought this system could use as many 8K sources as they wanted. So this product has seven 8K60 inputs and three outputs. So a lot of IO on the back of the AV10 makes this extremely flexible. Uh, we've also built in an entirely new DSP platform that lets us maximize the number of channels uh, output. So this is a 15.4 channel processor, whereas previously wow. we maxed out at 13.1. So not only does this give us the possibility of building a very large home theater with a lot of independent channels, but it lets us mix and match those channels to find the configuration that fits our room just perfectly. Um, so if we can dwell on the 0.4 for a minute, that's kind of an unconventional way of talking yeah. about a, a home theater receiver, right? Uh, or or a, a processor. So with uh, with this new DSP platform, we can process four subwoofer outputs independently of one another. Um, this gives us uh, a lot of possibilities. Um, I know Luke, you and uh, and your team at Gramophone and and Pete, you for sure have been major advocates of multiple subwoofers in theaters for a long time. And oh, why yeah. is that? Absolutely. Yeah, we you know, getting bass right in a room is so difficult, um, especially when there are placement limitations for the sub. So we've often overcome that by placing multiple subs around the room in different locations. We try and get them acoustically aligned. We get the bass nice and tight, and then we work on integrating it with the main system, right? So with, with the ability to process four independent subs, we can not only put four subs around the room, but we can send separate signal to each. And we worked with our partners at Odyssey to develop a variation of XT32 that can independently tune each of those subs. So that's, I think that's a, a huge development and opens up a lot of possibilities for people who are really trying to maximize the, the base in, in their home theaters. And then there's another feature that's possible also with, with multiple subs. We can assign bass from different quadrants of the room into their individual subs. So let's say for instance, we have a front left sub, a front right. We can send only bass from that front left group of speakers into the sub that's that's nearest. So that gives us a really tight sense of acoustic coherence when we're trying to integrate the sub with with the speakers nearest. So uh, major major improvements, I think, uh, in in terms of bass management with with AV10. And then there's a whole host of other improvements with with AV10 as well. I mean, from uh, from just a, acoustic tuning, you know, we we upgraded our HDAM SA3, uh, you know, discrete analog circuitry to be even better than uh, what's been found in our previous audio video products. Uh, we've got a, a toroidal transformer in there powering a linear power supply, so it's extremely low noise, uh, very high resolution. Uh, we've got preamp mode so that you can, uh, you know, individually turn off channels in the AVRs, you know, so that you can drive external amplifiers. So we've had uh, about two years worth of constant development going into the entire cinema series, and a, and a great number of that was in AV10. Yeah, I'm I'm personally super excited about the uh, four subs out. I mean, yes. it's, it's just hearing <laughs> it. I mean, I was lucky enough to hear it in different locations, and it, it's just been absolutely incredible. I mean just the difference, not realizing how much, how important bass is when you're truly in a true experience, in a true theater experience, it's just directional bass is gonna be an absolute game changer. Oh yeah, people. I the, like any of the quotes that I do for theater build outs, I, I don't let them leave without two subs, if not more, mm -hmm. but it's gotta at least be two, cause it's just one's not enough, not Absolutely. for a true theater. Gotta pressurize build. that room correct. Yeah, Absolutely. And it's, and it's now, beyond that, pressurizing too, right? I mean, it's about getting the bass tight and tuneful and like really integrated with your speakers. And, and that's what we built that feature in there for. So I have, I have a question. What 
and I know that this probably going to be a question pop up. What did they, what did we do before we used directional base? Like what was the previous generation? Like what's the difference between this type of base and um, like what was done in the past? Yeah. So in the past, I mean, you could put as many subs as you wanted in the room, but they were all going to share the same signal. And uh, and that works up to a point um, you know, that lets you send LFE to, you know, let's say, you know, two, three, four subs around the room. But it's really hard to get those subwoofers time aligned and integrated properly with the speakers nearest. So if you had a home theater, for example, that had large full range speakers up front, but had, uh, you know, let's say band limited or small speakers in ceiling or in wall behind, you've got the problem of crossing base over from those those small speakers behind you into subs that were potentially in front of you. And if that crossover point is high enough to really preserve a lot of dynamic range, like let's say 80 to 100 hertz, you're probably going to hear some lower mid-range artifacts coming from the front sub when they really should be located behind you with the rest of your surrounds and in-ceiling speakers. So you know, by, by using directional bass and being able to assign bass around the room into the subs nearest those speakers, you, you no longer have to worry about these, uh, these localization issues that we had when we were sending monophonic bass to a bunch of different subs. And that's why I'm really excited about it. Absolutely. Now, yeah. on the four subs, because I want to touch on something that's going to be coming here. So... One of the awesome things about the AV10 that I've been told is uh, we're going to be seeing some Dirac. Am I correct? Yeah, Dirac. Yeah, that's the thing we've all been waiting for. So, uh, so look, no shade at Odyssey XT32, right? I mean, we can we can really tune a room extremely effectively with that. But uh, those of us who have been building high end home theaters for a long time, um, and I know we all have, Dirac is a game changer. And I know Pete, you don't want to throw the word around, but I'm going to throw it around here. Um, you know, Dirac yeah. lets, us, lets us build those target curves that we know work really well, you know, in our shops, in our showrooms, in our own homes, and take those into somebody else's installation. So we can make somebody else's room sound like ours, right? With these target curves, we know exactly what it is that we're listening for, you know, when, when we go into a room. Um, the Dirac uh, their, their ability to, to mix phase domain and frequency domain information uh, to really dial in the performance of any one individual loudspeaker, I think is remarkable and is very well known in the industry. So, uh, so yeah, man, I, I know I'm psyched about bringing Dirac in and that's coming soon. I mean, that's within the next few weeks. So, so anybody that has an AV10, a Cinema 40 or a Cinema 50 will be able to upgrade to Dirac. Uh, by going to, to Dirac Live and, and buying the license there. And you can get two flavors to, to work with Maranta AVPs and AVRs as well. You can get the basic Dirac Live, which gives you uh, adjustment up to about 500 hertz. So that lets you really dial in your bass and your mid-range you know, to get your, uh, the low end of your theater just right. Or you can buy the full spectrum version that will let you apply correction from 20 hertz all the way up to 20K. That's awesome. Are you going to do... Um... Any any whispers about doing uh, was it Dirac's Dirac's base control? Are there upcoming active room treatment? So um, so loose lips sink ships. So I'm not going to let any secrets out. Um, okay. But I'm going to say that there are there are whispers, and uh, and we fully intend to have a, a long and prosperous relationship with our partners at Dirac. How's that? We'll take it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thanks, man. I want to circle back to something though. So Dirac, fantastic. The four subs, awesome. The one thing I do want to circle back to though is HDMI. And the reason mm -hmm. that I want to do that is what this product's doing with these quality components that are in it, which we're going to talk even more about, but with the Dirac, with the base management, with all these balanced pre-outs and an incredible amp that's going to be paired with it, this is going to compete in some serious high-end spaces. And what I wanted to get to with this was I can think, I won't say any names, of certain high-end processors out there that by all means they sound great. Mm -hmm. But my goodness, they cannot get this HDMI thing right. HDMI is hard. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. But as not only a someone who is pushing and selling these products, but someone who just enjoys them as an enthusiast. I just want it to work. And every experience I've had with a Marantz or Denon or just Massimo product in general, it just works. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's super important. I mean, um, 
I so like I, I've been in the high end audio space now professionally for about eighteen or nineteen years, and I, I like to think that I know what good sound is, and I know what good video is, um, and I'm picky, and quality is important to me. Nobody cares what it sounds like if it doesn't work. Nobody yes. cares what it sounds like if you come home and you're beating the remote against the wall because you can't get an input to switch or because you've got video and not audio. I mean, it's super frustrating. And let's be honest, guys, I mean, stuff's expensive. Um, and it's a leisure time activity for, for me, for probably you guys and, and our mutual customers. Um, we feel like it's our responsibility to deliver products that work. And HDMI is a big part of that. I mean, HDMI is how we interface with the rest of the world. Um, I think there are, as you said, a lot of good AV processors from um, a lot of much smaller companies around the world. I think where we have an advantage is in our scale. Um, we get first access to technology, you know, much earlier than than some of the other competitors get. And because we have an entire engineering team dedicated to building HDMI platforms for both Denon and Marantz, we've got that economy of scale and the ability to, to test and troubleshoot that, that some of the smaller companies don't. So that gives us the advantage, like in, in the case of AV10, of bringing a product to market that not only competes with the world's best in terms of sound quality, but also makes us a feature and reliability leader as well. Absolutely. Like, for example... With you being able to actually have seven 8K60, 4K120 ports, HDMI 2.1, for those who know what the spec is, in a world where you were able to do at least, give us at least one of those and just have the functionality at all back in 2020, there are manufacturers today, and I know there's been some troubles because of what happened in the world a couple of years ago sure, for yeah. everyone, but still, here we are, 2023, and there's more than a few that have no support for that yet. And they're, even their so-called backwards compatibility features aren't working all that well. Like, there are some products I've taken a PS5, plugged it into, and it can't even pass a 4K signal. And it's like, are you kidding me? Yeah, yeah, that's brutal, right? <laughs> it's yeah. tough. Yeah, I mean, look, somebody spinning the change on an AV10, an AMP10 system is, I don't know, I'm just going to guess that, like, you're probably not going to, you're going to get an AV10 and AM10 unless your theater is probably deep in the five figure range, you know, like all, all said and done. Yeah. Um, you're, you should fully expect to have that theater and enjoy every minute of it for many years to come. Um, so the reliability is extremely important to us. You know, we, we give these products a five year warranty, you know, which is at least two years better than a lot of the competition and four years better in, in the case of many. Um, and then also it's built in a modular fashion. I mean, you, you probably remember the AV8805, right? So, you know, when that, that came out, it had no AK support whatsoever. But last year we issued an upgrade to that product that brought AK support into it. So by having a fully modular platform in AV10, I think that, you know, customers can expect that, um, that as new technology comes out, we'll be able to support upgrades up to a point. And that is fantastic because I know that sometimes with, and I've seen this, have customers say this, sometimes with higher end processors, it's like, okay, spend X amount on a great processor. And yeah, by all means, it's good for what, three or four years until the next mm -hmm. HDMI comes out and then I got to do it all over again. So seeing that you're going to offer that kind of support, that's going to give a lot of peace of mind. Yeah. Yeah. Definitely comforting to me You know, when I get my set. <laughs> <laughs> oh, absolutely. But moving on from HDMI, which just, I'm so happy you guys are on top of that. Thank you. Let's talk a little bit about the audio circuitry of this, and then I think mm -hmm. we'll get to the AMP10, and then we'll talk a little bit about Bowers as well. With the new HDM SA3s that are in this, you said you got the toroidal transformer, all kinds of great innovation. What's what's the real secret sauce of the SA3? Why do the people listening want that? Yeah, so it's a it's a great question. So back in the 90s, we developed the notion of HDM to begin with. Um, you know, HDM was was our take on a fully discrete operational amplifier, and it outperformed the chip amps uh, of the time by a hundredfold in terms of resolution and speed and noise rejection. And we've continued to refine that discrete op amp topology over many years. And so now there are, are a variety of HDMs that we implement in different products across our portfolio. Um, HDM SA3 is what we use here in the AV10. And um, every time we come out with a new product, you know, we we make small changes and improvements to, to the HDMs over successive versions. 
and uh, and different products get different versions based on how they're used. You know, are they just buffers? Are they applying voltage gain? Um, but the takeaway here is that uh, S the, the SA3 that we built in in AV10 is is our absolute best ever for an AV product. Period. I mean, it it approaches the the quality that you get in our top end Hi-Fi kit, um, and there's there's like 19 of them in there, right? So there's a, there's a lot. So if we go so, back to that, I can thing, stop you right quick. Yeah. What you just said there, this is not too far apart from like a PM10, but for theater. Yeah, it's. I mean, there's there's a little bit of daylight, but not much. Um, yeah, I mean, that's I've got pretty my, good. Yeah, it's pretty good. I mean, I've got my AV10 and M10 right now, just running in two channel mode while I build out the rest of my theater, and uh, and just just listening to music, man. I mean, the thing jams. So, uh, so the picture that you had up previously showed the uh, the guts of uh, of an AV10, and you could see right down the middle um, all of these these HDAM cards. So, if you look just above the transform, all those vertical PCBs, each one of those is uh, is an HDAM uh, SA3, and that handles the audio in and, and audio out in, in the analog domain. Um, it's it's fully discrete, powered by that linear power supply, uh, and by building every channel on an independent PCB. We we get such incredibly high resolution and such great noise rejection. Um, you know how sometimes like you can flip an amplifier on, put your ear up against the speaker and you hear all kinds of noise and hissing yeah, and just, yeah I, can't stand it. yeah. I mean, so we got to remember dynamic range works both ways, right? Uh, oh, you yeah. do that with, with an AV10 and an amp 10 and it's, pretty quiet i mean i'm not going to promise like total silence but uh, but when you hear such low levels of noise you can be assured that uh, that the level of detail you get out of the system when it's really pumping is, is top notch and that is fantastic to hear because i know <laughs> speaking a little bit for me here but one of my favorite things in great audio products is when you can achieve that super low noise floor that lets you get all of that range and all of that fun really between the loudest louds and the softest quiet sounds in a track. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's exactly right. I guess the last thing to note too about uh, about HDAMs, and, and this is true not only of AV10 but of, of all Marantz products. That's where we do a lot of the tuning to get that last little bit of Marantz special sauce, right? So, uh, so I know you guys could probably close your eyes and pick out a Marantz uh, across a listening wall, you know, like that. You're you're used to hearing that sound. You know what it sounds like. Um, HDM gives us the opportunity to do uh, to do some tuning with our, our sound master in, in Japan. So uh, after we engineer a product, AV10 is, is no exception. It's the sound master's turn to, to have a turn at um, really identifying opportunities at the component level to just maximize performance to the nth degree. Mm. Fantastic. Well, that's the AV10, I think, mostly in a nutshell. But the AV10 has got a brother that goes with it, that being the Amp10, of course, a 16 channel amplifier with uh, gobs and gobs of power. Also got all the great audio chops featuring its own version of HDAMs, if I recall. Massive mm -hmm. power supplies, the works. What can you tell me more about the Amp10? What's, what's Morant's really aiming for with that versus, like, say, the previous separates? Like, what was it, the 8807? Yeah, so so if AV tends the brains, the AM tends the brawn, right? Like it's yep. it's the uh, it's the big boy. Um, Sixteen channels, two hundred watts per channel into eight ohms, uh, four hundred watts per channel into four. Um, it's got multiple output options too. Uh, you can run it in, in normal mode where you get all 16 channels. You can run it in buy-in mode where one input, uh, plays to two outputs. So if your speakers have got buy amp in, you know, you can split your frequency bands. And then there's also a bridge mode. So you can bridge channel pairs down and get 400 Watts into, into eight ohms. And because you can do that on a channel pair basis, there's a lot of flexibility in amp 10. Um, mm. Amp 10 was a ground up design as well. So, I mean, naturally to put that much power in that kind of box, we know we're talking about a switch mode amplifier, right? We didn't just go to the, the switch mode amplifier store and pick one. We designed these channels from the ground up. Um, so each amplifier channel pair is not only designed, but also built at our factory in Shirakawa, Japan. 
There are no fly wires, no loose wires routing signal anywhere in that product. Everything goes through our heavy copper uh, gold-plated bus bars. Um, the signal path is incredibly short from, from input to output, and there's entirely independent power supplies for the, the power amplifier side of the product and the line level side of the product. Um, mm. It's Dude, this thing is a monster, man. I mean, it, it sounds so, so good. Uh, and then there's some nice little visual touches on it too, right? So the, the power meter on the front, you know, we, we took a lot of inspiration from fine wristwatches and, uh, and we built a, a true DB uh, output meter, you know, right there on the front that's got like a nice little subtle light on it. It's, it's a really, really a beautiful piece to behold as well as listen to. Nice little throwback there. It sure is, man. Yeah. Now, with all these different options, which are awesome, you know, just to run it straight, run it by amp, run it bridge. Oh, speaking of bridge, you said 400 into eight. Can it do four ohm bridge loads? Yeah, I mean, it's not going to give you 400 watts, um, you know, but it's not going to commit suicide either, right? So, you know, whether uh, how it handles low impedance loads is going to depend a lot on how much power is being demanded of it, you know, at any point in time. Right. Um, one of the cool things about Amp 10 is that it's got a lot of active cooling in it. So if we look straight down in the floor of Amp 10, you'll see an array of fans that sit right under the power amplifier section. And uh, yeah, you can kind of see the labels of the fans there, uh, you know, right, uh, right underneath those amplifier channels. So mm -hmm. those will kick in and keep the amplifiers running at uh, optimal temperature. Um, we're, we're not going to let the amplifier overheat and, and commit suicide. Um, there's also a fan that runs across the power supply, you know, making sure the power supply is running at an optimal temperature all the time. So short answer, yeah, it can do uh, low impedance loads in, in bridge mode, but uh, we're not going to be able to max it out full power all the time into four ohms at, uh, in bridge right. mode. Right. But with but the ratings that it already has. I don't want to be in the room I, when it happens because it'll be so loud. Oh, I'm sure. With, with the ratings that it already has, though, we, we can all use our imaginations a, a little bit and be like, okay, if you're running most modern speakers and you're going to bridge a forum load, like you said, you're you're probably going to hurt yourself before you manage to hurt the amp. Yeah. Well, and you're also probably running crossovers, you know, into your subs, you know, and we know that yeah. it's, it's low frequencies, you know, that really place the highest demand on amplifiers. Oh, absolutely. And with that, in your subjective opinion, if I might ask, do you like running it better in biamped if you have that option, or do you think it sounds best in bridged? You're going to have to experiment on, on a per speaker basis. So it's going to depend a lot on how the crossovers are designed in, in the loudspeakers and, and depend a lot on uh, on how your theater is configured. So easy. You know, the, the nice thing about it, you can experiment. You know, the switch is right there on the back. Um, you know, you can run it in by amp mode, have a listen, reach behind the amp, you know, flip it into, into bridge mode, move your loudspeaker cables and try again and see which one works the best for you. Cool. Hey, experimentation's half the fun of this hobby, right? Sure is, man. Awesome. So brief note about the, um, about some of the new cinema series, we're not going to get into the nitty gritty of every single one of them, but if you were just to give a little general overview as the new of the new cinemas as a whole, what are they all doing differently from the SRs? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a great question. So the first thing to note about the cinema series is that we've gone to a new nomenclature. Uh, so unlike you know SR 6015, 5015, 7015, you know where the the larger the number, the higher up uh, the the product sat in the uh, in the line. Nowadays, we've, we're, we're kind of looking back to the Marantz of yesteryear, where the lower the number indicates the higher the position. So, uh, so Cinema 70S uh, occupies the, the bottom of the ladder for our new Cinema series. That's our, our beautiful slimline piece. Um, it's a, uh, a, a 7.1 uh, AVR. It'll do 50 watts per channel, um, fit into just about any piece of furniture, and make a mighty fine home theater you know, out of a small room. All the Cinema Series uh, AVRs got audio quality improvements over the, the SR and the NR series. So even if um, you're, you just want to compare apples to apples and sit down and listen to a piece of music between the two, I think you're going to like Cinema Series more in terms of sound quality. They all got HDMI uh, upgrades as well. So there's at least three HDMI 8K inputs on all the AVRs now. Um, once you get up into, uh, into Cinema 50, uh, you know, then you've got uh, 8K support across all the inputs. Um, so that's, I think, a, a pretty major improvement. 
um, you know, like AV10, Cinema 50 and Cinema 40 give you support for four subs. Uh, you know, whereas in the past we had two sub outs, but they were uh, they were in parallel with one another. So that's a big improvement. Um, and it's also hard to ignore just the, the beautiful aesthetic improvement that we've made in, in the lineup as well. Um, uh, the uh, the SR series and the NR series are definitely good looking products. I mean, that's an industrial design that we've used for a long time. But uh, but let's be honest, guys. I mean, the new Cinema Series stuff looks amazing. That it does. I I was super excited when we when when you guys first presented it to us. <clears throat> you know, that was the first thing. We, obviously, everyone sees is the look, and it, you know, still having the classic Marantz, you know, porthole display is is something that's iconic, and but also bringing it to the new age, I, I've really appreciated, you know, working for the company and seeing something mm. that, you know, not only looks and sounds incredible, but like it, it's a stand, it's a conversation piece. Like even just looking at this amp, this amp, uh, AV10 here, doesn't have any screws on the side. It's a very clean design. It looks incredible. And then, you know, seeing some of the pictures of it, of the internals, I almost wonder why we even have a top plate on it. Yeah. We should just let you be able to see right into it. it look, it's an absolute beautiful piece from the outside to the inside. It's so it's so well laid out, like all the HDMs just stacked up, perfect spacing. Yeah, it's really, it's really unique and really, really exciting for her. Yeah, I mean, myself, aesthetics, sure. aesthetics matter, you know. I mean, the, the, the look of a product, I think, speaks volumes about its quality overall. Um, it's not sufficient that a product sounds good to be called good. Um, I'm not going to go so far as to say that good sound is the easy part because it's it's not. I mean, we put quite a lot of engineering effort into making our our amps sound the way they do. But um, but a product should be easy to use. It should be reliable. It should look good. Um, you know, like we we agonize over even small details like the the weight and the haptics of the volume knob. You know, we want to get that just right. You know, so that it it feels a certain way. You know, when you go to uh, to adjust the volume or, or change inputs. Um, you know, little touches like the uh, the machined aluminum door that conceals the extra display and the front panel controls. Uh, you know, that stuff matters. I mean, I know a lot of our customers are going to put these in a rack, you know, maybe set off in an equipment closet somewhere, never to be seen. But uh, but at my house and certainly at a lot of our clients' house, it's going to be out on a credenza, you know, with the TV or it's going to be in a piece of furniture. And we don't want our living rooms to look like laboratories. You know, we want our, our living rooms to be places that are comfortable and, and warm and inviting. So so having, uh, you know, really attractive equipment, I think, is part of that. Oh, absolutely. It's it, it, it's a nice change just in general, because like the the old Morant's look, there's nothing wrong with it, but it was a little long in the tooth, maybe. And now something completely different and definitely yeah. better looking, if you ask me. And it catches cool. the eye. I mean, I know walking around, just seeing it like, you know, going to other events, it's not just a black box sitting on a table. It has unique looks to it. It has oh, lights yeah. on the side. It has that carbon kind of style in, imprint on it. It just it it's it's a statement piece for sure. And I'm super excited about it. Oh, yeah. It, it immediately is like, hey more interesting this time around for sure yeah yeah it's, it's cool no doubt well the new moran stuff is is looking fantastic i know i can't wait to play a little bit more with the av10 and really see what this guy can do but we're here for Morantz and for bowers so i want to transition a little bit and start talking about some cool new stuff by bowers uh those of you guys have been watching the channel you probably caught a couple videos we've done on px8 headphones well we got a little bit more to say about that in a little bit but Bowers has also dropped a new line of speakers in the last few months, and that is the version three of the 700 series, or more specifically, the 700 S3 series. And Pete, I think I'll be picking your brain a little bit more for this one. Yep, I'm sure Gary has some uh, input. As you know, it, it, oh, certainly. speakers are only speakers are only as good as their amplifier sometimes. But you know, luckily, and we vice have a pairing. It's going to be a uh, amazing sound. Absolutely. So, 700. S3, uh, a speaker that at first glance, I immediately thought to myself, hey, look, it's a baby 800. <laughs> yeah, we get that a lot. Um, you know, and the reason it, it is, is we developed the 800, right? That's our flagship product of the 800 series. And so a lot of what we, when we're building the 800 series, which we re released the D4 um, in 2020. Yeah, 2020. A few years ago. And, um, you know, it, it's incredible, but we learn as we're building it. And a lot of the stuff that we do is we, we trickle it down. And a lot of times it's economy of scale. It's, it's changing certain materials, you know, in the 800 series, we're using a diamond dome tweeter in the 700 series, we're, we, we're using a carbon dome tweeter. Both of them are still excellent tweeters. It's just, it's about cost at some point. The yeah, diamond tweeter is significantly more expensive to produce and putting that into 
the 700 series makes it you know into a different price point and that's mm -hmm. what we didn't really want to do we really wanted to be able to give the opportunity to any anybody to bring, be able to bring the studio home and that's really what these 700 series are able to do is it's able to be a studio style monitor speaker into your home and have a great experience whether you're listening to music or watching movies it's going to go hand in hand absolutely fantastic so i'm yeah again just another another product that i'm super excited about so this time around we've got uh which models have we got this time around we obviously got a 702 i think Se we still got a 703 yep so the new thing with the so the 702 uh is, is the flagship it still has the top mount tweeter yep um it still has the three base drivers and that's really it's going to stand stand out uh, if you notice it on the pedestal also it has a so the new thing with the 700 series is the pedestal is mandatory now and the reasons that it is is specifically on the 702 is it has a uh downward firing flow port and so oh, okay that's one of the reasons why it's built that way but by by designing it the way I designed it it's actually a little bit thinner than the than the s2 mm. um so simply by having it a weight to height distribution you need to have that plinth on it so that it's not falling it's kind of the the way it is, but also for acoustic reasons where the base port is on the 702 specifically. Uh, with the 703, we did something very different as well. We now added the top mount tweeter on the 703. So mm, okay. uh, with that, you know, we, we use the same elongated tweeter that we used in the uh, 800 series. It's a double, it's a dual uh, decoupling mechanism. So it's a dual point decoupling system. And, you know, it just really, it's what Bowers and Wilkins is traditionally known for is having that top top mount tweeter oh yeah and so by putting that into the 703 you know it's even it's adding on to what bowers and wilkins is known for is it having that elegant sound you know getting rid of diffraction getting rid of the first point reflection point for the tweeter and by lifting it up you know you're limiting the cabinet from the equation on that and so that's that's something that's very unique with the uh the 702 the 703 and the 705 in the 700 series as well as one of our one of our new centers it also has the top mount tweeter which is the first time in the 700 series that we actually have ever done that done that is put a top mount tweeter in our center uh speaker as well that's going to be awesome um hang around me long enough and you'll hear me talk about the need for for better center channels so that's awesome yeah we uh we definitely recognize that we definitely understand it and we we know that we want you know the center channel is a very important piece especially if you're you're doing a theater you know that's where a lot of the voices and a lot of the emotion of movies and, and entertainment that we're watching comes from and that's we don't want to you don't want to lose anything by having mm -hmm. amazing front left and right and then you know sacrificing everything in on, on, on the other rest of the speakers absolutely so with the new s3s other than uh, a little little bit of revisions to the tweeter to the tweeter body which is now very 800 like in its look which of course what else is going on underneath the skin that elevates this over the s2 so we don't even have to go underneath the skin i mean just looking at the speaker so we actually gave it a curved front baffle and what that's going to do is that actually brings the drivers out a little bit mm. it also eliminates diffraction diffraction is simply having walls up against your drivers and changing the way things sound so like you know a lot of times you can talk like this and you can kind of experience how it sounds it mm. changes the way it sounds and so by curving that cabinet it brings the drivers out a little bit for, further so that the first reflection point isn't its own cabinet it's something else in the room which is what you want from the speaker and we really learned that by having the reverse wrap on the 800 series speakers and so that was a big thing that we changed all across the whole line on the 700 series it's not just in the 702 it's all the way through the whole line they all have a little bit of curve and by bringing that driver out a little bit we're able to actually make it a little bit thinner and that's why the plinth is also necessary for that and so that's something that we've really done um done with it yes now internally we've updated the magnets we're still using carbon dome tweeters we're still using continuum as our mid base driver and we're still using a um paper kevlar base driver uh with airfoil technology that's a, another thing that's absolutely incredible with, with these speakers um but internally you know we've also updated the, cro the crossover we've added mundorf capacitors which help lower the noise floor that's a good we talked name. about we talked about the noise floor and the amp amplifiers you know there we want to lower that noise floor within the speaker. We want it to be as quiet as possible when you don't want it to make any noise. And when when it is able to wake up and play some music or play some play a movie, you know, that's when we want it to wake up and that's what we want you to hear. Mm. That's awesome. So with the new series, what would you say is your just subjectively, your favorite thing listening to it versus the S2? I mean, that's a that's that's a I it, it's a tough question. It it's they just, it, the realism, you know, there's some, you want to, you want to say it, Gary? 
Man, so, okay, so I got to go visit uh, the factory in Worthing back in, uh, I guess it was October of last year, and uh, Andy walked me around and, and took me into the listening room, and we got to do direct comparisons S2 to S3. It was so much fun, right? To me, I mean, as, I'm a huge fan of S2s. I have S2s. The S3s have just that extra detail and that extra nuance that you don't really know is missing until you hear it in comparison, right? And, and I don't know what that's due to. I don't know if that's um, if that's the the better tweeter technology or if it's the lack of uh, of diffraction, as you say, you know, on the on the front baffle. But but to me, I'm such a sucker for resolution and getting more of that out of the S3 is so entertaining for me. Yeah, I, I would completely agree. I mean, the, the, I did the same type of thing in AD comparison, and there's almost a point where you're listening to it and you feel like you're missing something in the S3 and what you realize that you're missing noise is the noise level. It just kind of eliminates. Mm -hmm. It's so clear. You know, that's why it was kind of a, a challenge for me to first answer that because you're like, it's not necessarily what you're hearing more. It's what you're hearing less and the detail that you're hearing it. And that's what, that's what makes these speakers really stand out and what, what makes them sound absolutely incredible. Um, you know, I've, I've heard a lot of speakers. I'm sure you guys heard a lot of speakers. These are, some of the best sounding speakers in their price point. And that's really what Bowers Wilkins always strives to do is yeah. put is make the best sounding speaker for the in their class. And I think that the S3 series really just is the epitome of that. Is it is the it is going to be the best sounding spe speaker in its class. when when I got to hear the S3 and you know we finally got a pair up on display here, some solid amplification on them. And immediately what jumped out to me was like you had said, everything was a little bit more real. But on that note of lack of noise, that's helping me realize something. I did sometimes feel that like with the S2, there could be a touch of harshness here and there. The S3, there's little to none of that. It's just, it's cleaner through and through. And you retain all that detail and in fact, extract even more, but with less of a cost of any kind of sibilance or just anything you don't want. It just does everything better. Yeah, and that's the thing. And it's not that the, you know, the series before the S2s were, were bad in any way. I mean, no, they were excellent. They were absolutely incredible speakers. Uh, it's just taking it, learning, you know, having more time with a continuum driver, having more time to develop the cabinets, having more time to develop, you know, the elongated tweeter, having more time to work with Mudorf capacitors, having more time to, you know, add on to the crossover. You're just, you're just improving it little by little. And, you know, to talk about Gary, you know, I don't think it's one thing or another that makes these speakers sound better. I think it's everything, everything putting together makes a huge difference. And it's little by little, you know, Bowers and Wilkins isn't that type of company that's going to do little changes to just make little adjustments. They want to come out with something new and it's going to be, you know, changing this. A serious experience. sum, like uh, something yeah, to really exactly. consider. It's going to be a whole new series. Otherwise we'd come out with a new speaker with a little change here, a little change there, a little change there every year. But that wouldn't make sense because it's when you put everything together and you get everything all at once, you have a great experience. And then when you pair it, with a perfect amplifier or perfect processor, you know, it all comes together as just an, a great experience. And that's what we're, that's what we're really showing off here. We're showing it. It's, it's easy to sell speakers and amplifiers and like that. But we're trying to sell an experience and, you know, the best experience that I've come to, to know and love is going with a Bowers and Wilkins type of sound with, with proper power. Fantastic. With the um, with the new S3s, what kind of options are we looking at for colors, finishes? Yeah, so we changed a little bit this year. We still have our traditional black and white. Mm -hmm. um, we've we've eliminated the rosnut in America, and we've actually replaced it with a mocha. So it's going to be more mm -hmm. of a traditional style wood, um, a little bit darker. Of a, it's not going to have the red tint. Um, the rosnut, you may still see some of those, but those are going to be mostly in Asia and in Europe. Gotcha. Uh, so. That being said, they're not really going to be available, readily available in the United States. Uh, and that's just because, you know, what our culture is here in the United States and what we what we want. And, you know, we've had a lot of people, you know, myself been asking for this wood grain style, this mocha finish. And that's, you know, I'm super excited about it. I absolutely love the look of it. Um, you know, it's not it's not as uh, as beautiful as the signature series that we came out with, but it's still an incredible, but you know, you never know what's going to come out in the future. Oh, of course. I think the Mocha is a really welcome change. I think that's just what people are more so into. I know I like it better. Yeah. It's, I like, I like seeing the, 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 you know, the grain of the wood, but you know, it's really hard to match when it's red necessarily. Like I yeah. like seeing the, the Mocha finish, you know, it's, it's, that's probably the color that I'll be getting myself when I uh, end up pull the trigger and, and buy the pair myself. So fantastic. Yeah. Super excited about it.
So that's the new 700 S3. And before we move on to talking about the PX8s and particularly how this awesome partnership with McLaren came to be, guys, if you've been watching and you can think of any questions that you want to ask any of us, now is the time to do so. Because while we cover this, think of what you want to say, go ahead and ask, and then we'll get to the Q&A and we can take care of your questions. So PX8s, awesome headphone, one that really... I got to say, impress me. And in the past couple generations back, I got to say, I wasn't all that drawn to Bowers headphones, truth be told. But PX7 S2 comes out, starts to get my attention. PX8 comes out. Okay, they were taking this seriously. Like, th this is a great headphone. Yeah, it was, um, it, it, I, I had a uh, challenging experience because I, I knew the PX8s were coming out, but had to introduce the PX7s as our best sounding headphone. But we had to, Make sure we said yet because we've all heard the px8s and it was just the sound difference is absolutely incredible just from not only the quality of the audio but the noise canceling that's built inside of it you know it has uh aptics adaptive built yep. inside so it's just an absolute incredible so sounding pair of headphones the noise canceling is is the active and passive that's built in it's just absolutely incredible um we've changed a lot of the a lot of the not necessarily changed because it's it's a it's its own line, so it's not really referenced to the the PX7 S2s. But you know, just measuring how much the pressure it presses on your head. You know, we want we want our speakers to sound as good to sound as good as they look. Same can be said about our headphones. We want them to sound as good as they look, and these absolutely look incredible. Whether the McLaren edition or the James Bond edition or the traditional PX8 uh, headphones, they're going to look incredible and they're going to sound incredible. And I'm really really excited about having them. Oh my gosh, what, what what I love about these beyond just the sound quality as well is Bluetooth headphones just don't fit me very well. Like I can't fully get my earlobe underneath the ear cup and it just drives me crazy after more than like 15, 20 minutes. These are one of the few pairs I can put on and it's like, oh, these, these are actually comfortable. These aren't going to drive me insane. Yeah, I mean, I, I live here on the East Coast. Our offices are in the West Coast, so I'm constantly on flights back and forth, you know, four or five, six hour flights, mm. um, you know, and having something on your head, pressurizing, you know, sometimes can get uncomfortable. You can, you can, you, you know, you take them off, you kind of stretch, you, you, you can feel the pressure and but you want to continue watching a movie or listen to your podcast or whatever. So you put them back on, you just kind of just deal with it. Pain. Yeah. I wear these and sometimes I forget I even have them on and it, and just, and with that, you know, with me traveling a lot, the technology that's built inside of it, um, from me taking them off, it will automatically pause whatever I'm listening to. From me lifting just the ear cup to talk to uh, whoever is coming by to, you know, offer me a, a snack or a drink, you know, I can just lift up my ear cup and it's pausing what I'm listening to. It's not going to be, you know, I don't have to, you know, rush to find where my phone is or anything to pause it. Like if I'm listening to a podcast, I'm not sitting there with my phone in my hand. I have my my phone in the the pocket behind us so i'm able to just easily pause it play it you know whatever put it back on it starts right back up so the technology that's built into it as well as you know the audio that's built into it is just you know incredible yeah really happy about it uh but the mclarens you know we didn't really talk about why the mclaren edition and that's that's something that has been a long-standing uh partnership for us is with mclaren mclaren automotive really i did not know it was it was longer than this yeah so it, we've we've actually designed speakers that go in inside of mclaren cars so if you've well, there ever, you go if you've ever been lucky enough to go into mclaren or drive a mclaren you know you might have noticed we even have a top mount tweeter on the dashboard in many of their cars so it a lot of people think it's a microphone but it's actually just a tweeter just like on our traditional speakers they have a top mount tweeter right there on the dash and they use our our speakers and and it's really unique because it's a partnership with mclaren um amongst other automotive automotive pack partnerships but you can't buy these speakers you know at a store you they it comes with the car you have to design the car with them built in yeah and you can't do it aftermarket so it, it, it is a very very unique experience and that's one of the things that we were only want to show off with these headphones is the unique unique experience and the unique partnership I mean, that it's the uh mclaren orange that we that we really love and that's what we put on here awesome and then of course the mclaren partnership is awesome these are kind of the, the wild looking ones with the bright orange all those amazing looking accents but then he did the 007 edition and i didn't see that coming at all and it was like i remember opening them up for doing our highlight on them being like oh my gosh this finish is like perfectly like the bluing on a walther yeah absolutely i mean the, the the double the 007 we released first and those were you know absolutely incredible just 
the partnership, it, it really ties in the, the, the UK of both James Bond himself and Barris and Wilkins, but, um, you know, just absolutely incredible. We've had great response, and these are just going to get just as good of a response from those. Oh, I, I think they will. And I mentioned a little something special going on with these. Enter in a contest to win a pair of PX8 McLarens. These are worth 800 bucks. Go do that. Absolutely. Can I share a little absolutely tidbit with you, too? It. So all yes. the Marantz AVRs, have a feature called Bluetooth rebroadcast. So let's say you're watching a movie at home. Um, it's a movie you love, but maybe the rest of the family is like, eh, I'm done, I'm gonna go to bed, turn it down. You can turn on Bluetooth rebroadcast and finish the movie on your McLaren PX8 sitting on the sofa watching the big screen. Pretty cool. So what you're saying is whoever wins a pair of these also needs to purchase a, uh, an AV10. AV10 to be able to do that. Highly <laughs> recommended. Highly, Highly recommended. I like yeah. it. And, and some 700 series of Bowers and Wilkins speakers. Well, well, we got a winning combo in all directions here. Yeah, absolutely. I also want to thank you, Gary, for uh, hopping on here. I know. I know. Yes, thank you, Gary. Tuning in from Lexington, Kentucky, might be a little rough, but it's all it's all good. We're, we're no, really man, it's, it's a, yeah, always a pleasure, Pete, to hang with you for sure. And Luke, yeah, always glad to be on, man. Really appreciate the invite. Oh, we love having you, man. Thanks so much for joining. And it was a great, great discussion. I can't wait to see what the AV10 can really do and put it through its paces a little bit. And here we go. Here's a question. Let's see. Are Morant's components and VW speakers paired in their respective design phases to create a unique voicing timbre? That is a very excellent question from Wilson. What do you guys got for that? You want to take that first, Pete? Um, yeah, sure. I know when Bowers and Wilkins speakers are designed, they're using a number of different amps to test them. So I know we use class A, but we also use Morant specifically. Um, and so that's, you know, again, again, I wouldn't say that we design our speakers to specifically work with any particular amp mm. or cause that, that just wouldn't be a good business practice. Um, but I know that we do use our own products to test them and, you know, we, we find that they, they work really, really well together. Uh, Gary, anything on the rant side? Yeah, I, I echo that. Um, I mean, I think that we've got a bit of a mutual admiration society between our brands. Uh, you know, there were a lot of systems out there even before our companies came under the same umbrella. Uh, when we developed Morant's equipment in the lab, uh, we definitely have Bowers and Wilkins loudspeakers, but uh, we've got loudspeakers from other brands as well. But, but I think the overall theme here is that well-designed equipment is just going to work well together period, right? So we know Bowers and Wilkins speakers are incredibly well engineered. We've got a lot of respect for them. We know what to expect out of them. So we feel pretty confident in judging the quality of, of our equipment in the lab when we're listening to, to Bowers and Wilkins loudspeakers. I'd say it's pretty solid. So it's in a nutshell, it's not like they're specifically made for each other, but there is that thought in mind and they certainly will pair up and be fantastic. Absolutely. Yeah. What else we got? MP George says, looking for speakers for our edition. The Mocha will be great. Yes, yes, it will. I think that Mocha looks fantastic. Yeah, I'm, I I saw that. I saw those, and it was just, you know, you see them, and you're just like, yep, those are the ones I'm going to get. Oh, yeah. It, it, it's one of those things where it's such a, I don't want to say unique color or anything like that, but just different from what Bowers and Wilkins traditionally has done. And so that's what, I, that's what really excites me about it. Um, and the accent pieces, you know, the, the black on the top, the silver lining, it, it's all, it all just is a beautiful speaker. And I'm really excited to have them uh, in my own home. Yeah, I mean, they're furniture great, right? I mean, they're they're beautiful, you know, like the, it's, a, it's a natural wood color. It's really easy to, to match it with, uh, with good quality furnishings. But uh, man, it is, it is so nice, you know, so, so pretty. I'm with you, man. I would, I would very much like to have that finish in my home as well. Yeah, absolutely. I'll design my I'll design the rest of my home around those speakers. Yeah. It'll, be, it'll be easy for that. Let me know how the rest of the family thinks about that. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm I'm single, so I'm I'm by myself. So oh, okay. Not married yet, so I'm good. <laughs> I make my own decisions for now. <laughs> good man. A Michael Phipps says, "How much is the McLaren? The PX8 McLaren Edition headphones are seven ninety nine. Did I got that right? Yep, okay. seven ninety nine. Unless he was talking about an actual McLaren." Uh, if you're trying my, to buy a McLaren it's Senna, rate, it's so it, it, it's know. a lot more than we, than we can handle right yeah. now. That's for sure. At least us. Yeah, I, I don't think 799 is going to get you an oil change. 
Yeah, yeah, probably not. So. And just a little reminder for you guys, you can buy PX8s, McLaren editions, 007 editions, the standards, whatever you want, over at skybygramophone.com. Fast and free shipping, just click that link. Makes it very nice and convenient. We got anything else question-wise? Any other comments from our friends here? Let's see if we got any more. Hypertendency says, this is pretty cool. Uh, I am glad you think so, Hypertendencies. Yeah. I am very we, glad you we think, think so. so too. We're, we're really <laughs> excited about it. Luciano says the this new one visual of Marantz, it's very beautiful, as in referring to the aesthetic. Yeah, I, I really like what they've done with the aesthetic. Old one wasn't bad, but it was a bit old, and now this is just completely different. It's fresh, it lights up, it's and just it, cool. It stands out from other other brands. Yeah, it, it's it's, it's a, like that's Marantz you know, now. Much there's so many callbacks you. to like historical Marantz designs too. I mean, like the way we're using the porthole obviously is is one, but uh, the left to right symmetry, you know, that's something that you found all the way back in the original audio console. You know, the first you know, Marantz product ever. Um, you know, so if you if you study the the new design long enough, you'll see where the inspiration came from. Absolutely, I, I have been looking into the past, and I've I've noticed that you guys have definitely a. Uh, brought it to the forefront of the future, but also kept the, the historical, the past. Yeah. And Kenneth says, thanks so much for doing this. Hey, you're welcome, man. Thanks so much for being here. Absolutely. I hope it was helpful for you. Don't forget to enter to win. Yes. Ooh. Remontal VO. If I said that wrong, I apologize. Has Marantz considered reissuing a legacy integrated amplifier like NAD is doing? Something that goes back in time and provides a bit of nostalgia. That is an interesting idea. That is kind of a cool idea. Yeah, to my knowledge, we're not working on anything like that, but uh, but that would be pretty cool. I mean, I know a lot of us that that got into to audio as as teens probably were initially introduced through our dad's old Marantz. 2215b or 2275 or or you know maybe even um you know a real hot shot like uh you know model 500s or something like that but uh yeah it's it's not something that i'm aware of of being on the roadmap but it sure would be an interesting experiment to bring some of the the engineering expertise we have these days to uh, to a legacy design yeah good idea man we'll we'll take that under advisement yeah, I'd say put that in the suggestions hat because yeah, something cool. that kind of makes that would look like the old Saul Morantz days. I think that'd be really cool. Yeah, that would be pretty cool. And I think that is it for our questions. So, Pete, Gary, thanks for hanging out with me, guys. Thank you for having us. I, I really appreciate you guys taking the time and putting something like this together and letting us, you know, get out in front of your audience and talk about both Morantz and Bowers and Wilkins. Yeah, echo oh, that as well. Fun. Of course, uh, always a good hang. You know, great to chat with you guys. Absolutely. And so, guys, we're going to get ready to sign off here. But keep in mind, the new Bauer series, the 700 S3, and the new Marantz product, be it the AV10 and the Amp10 or the new Cinema receivers, all of these have been going up on display at all of our showrooms. So you can come check that stuff out. Come here and audition it for yourself. Because you should always listen to your ears when making your purchasing decision. And you can come find us in any of our locations. We're in Timonium. We're in Columbia. We have a showroom in Gaithersburg. And we have our lovely Kitchen Design Center in Hunt Valley as well. So before you sign off, don't forget to subscribe to the Gramophone channel. Check out some of our cool social media links for a bunch of info on all of this stuff and much, much more. And of course, we'll be seeing you. And I'll have more highlights and the usual coming for you very soon.